Livy on Hannibal. Livy, book 28. One. With Hasdrubal's crossing of the Alps, much of the war had been transferred into Italy, and there seemed to have been correspondingly less action in the Spanish theater. Suddenly, however, hostilities again flared up, here as serious as before. At that point, the Roman and Carthaginian occupation of Spain was as follows. Hasdrubal, son of Gisgo, had fallen back as far as the coastline of the ocean at Gades and the shores of our sea, and practically all of eastern Spain was under the control of Scipio and Rome. A new commander, Haino, had crossed from Africa with a fresh army to replace Hasdrubal, Barca. He had joined up with Mago, and had quickly put under arms large numbers of men in Celtiberia, which lies between the two seas. Scipio, therefore, sent Marcus Silanus to confront him with 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. Silanus forced the pace of his march as much as he could, though the poor condition of the roads and narrow passes, often hedged by forests, terrain frequently encountered in Spain, slowed him down. Even so, he outran not only messengers who might report that his arrival, but even any rumor of it, and reached the enemy guided by some local Celtiberian deserters. When the Romans were about ten miles from the enemy, they learned from these same deserters that there were two enemy camps alongside the road they would be taking. One, the left, were the Celtiberians, a newly raised army of more than 9,000 men, and on the right was the Carthaginian camp. The Punic camp, was well guarded, they were told, with outposts, sentries, and all the usual security features of military operations. But the other was poorly and carelessly defended, as one would expect from barbarians who were also new recruits, and whose fears were diminished because they were in their own lands. This was the one that Solanus thought should be attacked first, and he ordered the troops to keep to the left as much as possible so they would not at any point be spotted from the Carthaginian outposts. Then, sending ahead scouts, he advanced on the enemy at a rapid pace. 2. Salanus was about three miles away, and still none of the enemy had spotted him, thanks to the cover provided by the uneven terrain and the shrub-covered hills. There was a hollow here that was deep and thus hidden from view, and in this he told his men to sit and take food. Meanwhile, scouts arrived confirming what the deserters had said. The Romans then threw all their baggage together in their mitts, took up their weapons, and advanced for the fight in regular battle order. They were a mile away when they were spotted by the enemy, and suddenly there was panic. Mago, too, came riding up at a gallop from his camp as soon as the shouting and uproar broke out. There were in the army of the Celtiberians 4,000 heavy armed troops and 200 cavalry. These constituted a full legion 
and were the pick of their forces. And so Mago placed them in the front line, setting the rest, the light-armed troops, in reserve. He then led them all from the camp, formed up in this manner, and barely had they gone beyond their palisade when the Romans hurled their javelins at them. The Spaniards crouched down in the face of the enemy, Barrage, and then rose to hurl theirs in turn. The Romans, in their usual close formation, received them with shields locked tightly together. Then they closed in and proceeded to fight with the sword. However, the broken ground rendered the speed of the Celtiberians, whose practice it was to run to and fro in the fight, ineffectual, while at the same time it did not disadvantage the Romans, who were used to stationary combat. The only problem for the Romans was that the restricted space and clumps of bushes precluded keeping ranks and imposed a pattern of fighting individually or two-on-two, two, as in a gladiatorial match. And while the setting impeded the enemy flight, it also delivered them as though bound hand and foot to slaughter. After nearly all the heavy-armed Celtiberians had been dispatched, it was the turn of the light infantry and the Carthaginians who had come to their aid from the other camp to be driven back and cut down. A contingent of no more than 2,000 infantry and all the cavalry fled the field with Mago when the battle had barely got under way. The other commander, Hanno, was taken alive, together with those who had arrived last on the field, when the battle was already lost. Almost all the cavalry and the older men in the infantry who followed the fleeing Mago reached Hasdrubal in the area of Gades nine days later. The Celtiberians, the new recruits, slipped away into the woods close by and then scattered to their homes. It was a timely victory. The war already stirred up was not terminated by it, it is true, but the makings of a future war were terminated, that is, the possibility that the Carthaginians, after rallying the Celtiberian people, could incite, it could incite further tribes to arms. Scipio warmly praised Salanus and now gained hope of finishing off the war, if he did not himself hold up the campaign by postponing action. He therefore marched on Hasdrubal in the furthest reaches of Spain, where the last vestiges of the conflict still remained. The Carthaginian general happened to have his camp in Batica to ensure the loyalty of his allies, and he now suddenly pulled out, taking his troops towards the ocean coast of Gades, in what was more of a flight than a march. He decided that he would always be threatened with attack as long as he kept his army together, and so before making the journey through the strait to Gades, he sent off his entire army to various cities. Thus the men would have walls to defend them, and they could defend the walls with their weapons. 3. Scipio saw that the theater of war was now widely fragmented, and that taking his forces round to individual cities would be time-consuming rather than difficult, and so he turned back. 
But in order not to leave the region in enemy hands, he sent his brother, Lucius Scipio, with 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry to attack the wealthiest city in those parts, which was called Orongus by the barbarians. The city lies in the lands of the Masses, a tribe of the Bastatani. It has fertile soil, and there is also some silver mining there. This served as Hasdrubal's base for his raids on peoples living in the interior of the country. Scipio encamped close to the city, but before proceeding to the common volation, sorry, again, Scipio encamped close to the city, but before proceeding to the circumvallation, he sent men to the gates to parley with the inhabitants at close quarters, to probe their feelings and urge them to try out the friendship rather than the might of the Romans. The response was not a friendly one, and so he surrounded the city with a ditch and a double rampart. He then split his army into three divisions, so as to have one always on the attack while the other two were resting. When the first division commenced the attack, there was a fourth fierce fight, which produced no clear result. Approaching the walls and bringing up ladders as weapons rained down on them, was no easy task. Even those who had managed to set up their ladders against the wall were thrust down with forks made especially for the purpose, or else had grappling irons thrown on them from above, so that they faced the danger of being hoisted up and dragged on top of the wall. When Scipio realized that because of his numerical inferiority, the chances of victory were about even, and that the enemy had the further advantage of fighting from their walls, he recalled the first division and assaulted the town with the two others together. The enemy were exhausted from fighting the wave, and this tactic struck so much fear into them that the townspeople suddenly fled and abandoned the walls, while the Punic garrison, fearing the city had been betrayed, left their post and gathered together in one spot. At that point, the fear came over the townspeople that if the enemy entered the city, all those in their path would be indiscriminately butchered whether they were Carthaginian or Spanish. And so they suddenly threw open a gate and rushed from the town in large numbers. They held out their shields before them for fear of being the targets of missiles thrown at long range, but showed their empty right hands to make it clear that they had thrown their swords aside. Whether this could not be seen because of the space between them or whether treachery was suspected is unclear. But the deserters came under attack and were cut down just as if they were a regular battle line. Then, using the same gate, the troops took the fight into the city. And at other points, too, gates were being hacked down and broken up with axes and picks, and as each cavalryman entered, he would gallop forward, following prior orders, to secure the forum. The cavalry had also been assigned a detachment of triari. As support, the legionaries made a sweep of the other areas of the city. They did not loot and did not kill any they met, except when they met armed resistance. All the Carthaginians 
were put under guard, as were about three hundred of the townspeople who had closed the city gates. The rest had the town put back in their hands and their property returned. In the assault on the city, there were about 2,000 enemy casualties and no more than 90 Roman. Four. Taking that particular town brought satisfaction to those involved in the operation, but it also brought satisfaction to the commander-in-chief and the rest of the army, and the men provided a fine spectacle as they arrived, driving a huge crowd of prisoners before them. Scipio praised his brother in the most glowing terms comparing the capture of Orangus with his own capture of New Carthage. But winter was now coming on, making it impossible for him to launch an assault on Gades or hunt down Hasdrubal's army. Scattered all over the province as it was, and he therefore led all his forces back to hither Spain. He then spent the legions off, then he sent the legions off to their winter quarters and dispatched his brother Lucius to Rome, along with the enemy commander, Hanno, and other prisoners of note. After that, he himself withdrew to Turaco. That same year, a Roman fleet was sent across from Sicily to Africa under the proconsul Marcus Valerius Lavinus, and this conducted widespread raids on the countryside around Utica and Carthage. Booty was actually taken off from around the very walls of Utica on the fringes of Carthaginian territory. As the Romans were sailing back to Sicily, they were met by a Punic fleet of 70 warships. 17 of the Carthaginian ships were captured and four sunk out at sea. The remainder of the fleet was driven back and put to flight, victors on land and sea. The Romans heated back to Lilibaeum, carrying large quantities of plunder of every kind, the sea having now been made safe by the defeat of the enemy fleet. Supplies of grain were shipped to Rome in large quantities. 5. The proconsul Publius Sulpicius and King Attalus passed the winter on Agena, as noted above, and at the beginning of the summer in which these events occurred, they crossed from there to Lemnos. Lemnos, sorry. They crossed from there to Lemnos. With their fleets combined, there were 25 Roman quinquiremes and 35 belonging to the king. Philip also made a move, wishing to be ready for any initiative on the part of his foe, whether he had to meet him on land or sea. He came down in person to the coast at Demetrius, and proclaimed a date for his army to muster at Larissa. At the news of the king's coming, embassies from the allies converged on Demetrius from all parts. This was because the Aetolians, 
had felt a surge of confidence thanks to their alliance with Rome, and also after the arrival of Attalus, and were making predatory raids on their neighbors. And the Arcanians, Botians, and inhabitants of Euboea were not alone in feeling great alarm. So, too, did the Achaeans, who, apart from the Aetolian War, were also being intimidated by the Spartan tyrant Machanides. Machanides, who was encamped not far from the borders of Argos. All these alleys gave an account of the dangers threatening their various cities by land and sea, and made a plea for assistance from the king. Even the reports from Philip's own kingdom indicated no peaceful state of affairs there. Scaradelaus and Pluratus were up in arms, he was told, and some of the Thracian tribes, especially the Maedae, would overrun the parts of Macedonia closest to them should the king be preoccupied with a long war. The Boeotians and peoples of the interior of Greece were also reporting that the pass at Thermopylae, at the point where the road is restricted in a narrow defile, was being blocked by the Aetolians with a ditch and a palisade in order to deny Philip passage to defend the cities of his allies. Even a listless commander would have been galvanized to action by so many emergencies all around him. Philip dismissed the embassies with a promise to bring assistance to them, all as time and circumstances permitted. Peperithus was for the moment the most pressing item on his agenda. Word had come from there that Attalus had taken a fleet across from Lemnos and had laid waste all the countryside around the city. And he sent a garrison to protect the town. He also sent Polyphantus with a modest force into Boatia. And to Chalcus, he sent an officer of his royal guard, Menippus, with a thousand peltasts. The pella is a shield not unlike the catra. Menippus was given an additional force of 500 Agrianes to enable him to defend all areas of the land. Philip himself left for Scatosa and gave orders for Macedonian troops to be brought over to that town from Larissa. At Scatosa, it was reported to him that the, a council meeting of the Aetolians had been scheduled at Heracula, and that King Attalus would be coming to discuss with them the overall direction of the war. Philip then led his troops by forced marches to Heracla in order to disrupt the meeting by suddenly appearing on the scene. The meeting had in fact been adjourned before his arrival, but the crops in the fields were close to ripeness, 
and before leading his troops back to Skatasa, Philip made a thorough job of destroying them, especially along the gulf of the Ionanses. The meeting had, in fact, been adjourned before his arrival, but the crops in the fields were close to ripeness, and before leading his troops back to Skatasa, Philip made a thorough job of destroying them, especially along the gulf of the Ionianes. He then left his entire army at Skatasa and withdrew to Demetrius, with only his royal guard. After that, to enable him to counter any enemy move, he sent men into Phocis, Euboea, and Para. Thus, sorry, <sighs> terrible, terrible. He then left his entire army at Skatasa and withdrew to Demetrius with only his royal guard. After that, to enable him to counter any enemy move, he sent men into Phocis, Euboea, and Pepper Ethus to pick out elevated locations from which beacons could be visible. Philip himself installed a lookout post on Tisaeus, a mountain with an enormously high peak, so that from fires raised at distant points, he could in a moment receive intelligence on any of his enemy's operations. The Roman commander and king Attalus sailed from Peperethus over to Nicaea, and from there they moved the fleet across to the city of Oreus in Euboea. When one leaves the Gulf of Demetrius heading for Chalcis and Euripus, Oreus is the first of the Euboean cities on the left-hand side. An arrangement was made between Attalus and Sulpicius that the Romans would make the attack from the sea, and the king's forces would do so by land. Six. It was three days after the fleet put in that they commenced their assault on the city. The intervening time had been spent on secret discussions with Plator, who had been put in command of the city by Philip. The city has two citadels, one overlooking the sea and the other in the center of town. From the latter, a road leads down to the sea by an underground passageway, and at that time it was safeguarded where it reached the sea by a first-rate defense work, a five-story tower. It was in this sector that fierce fighting broke out. The tower had been equipped with projectiles of all kinds, and in addition artillery and siege engines had been put ashore from the ships for an attack on it. While the struggle diverted everyone's attention and all were looking on, Platar led in the Romans through the gate of the citadel and was beside that was beside the sea. 
and the citadel was taken in a moment. The townspeople, driven back, headed for the other citadel, in the city center, and there men had been posted to close the gate on them. Shut out like that, they were cut down or captured between the two citadels. The Macedonian garrison stood massed together beneath the wall of the citadel. It had not run off in panic, but it had not joined the battle with determination either. With Sulpicius, permission, Plater put the men aboard some ships and set them ashore at Demetrium in Pithiotus. Plater himself then went back to join Attalus. Emboldened by his easy success at Oreus, Sulpicius immediately headed for Chalkis with his victorious fleet. But there the result in no way matched his expectations. Here the sea forms a channel, wide at both extremities, but then becoming a narrow strait giving anyone first looking at it the impression of a double harbor, with two mouths at opposite ends. But one would be hard-pressed to find a more inhospitable mooring for a fleet. From the high mountains on both sides, sudden squalls come rushing down. In addition, the actual strait, the Euripus, does not ebb and flow seven times daily at regular intervals, as people say, rather surging this way and that as capriciously as a wind. It hurls along like a torrent on the sheer mountainside. As a result, night or day, there is no calm mooring for ships. The fleet faced not only an inhospitable anchorage, but also a town that was unflinching in its resolve and impregnable. It was enclosed on one side of the sea, while on the landward side it was superbly fortified and well secured, thanks to its strong garrison and especially to its steadfast officers and dignitaries, so different from Oreas with its wavering and fleeting loyalties. It had been a foolhardy enterprise, and the Roman now showed good judgment, taking account of the difficulties involved and not wishing to waste time. He swiftly abandoned the venture and moved his fleet across to Sinus in Lucrece. Sinus serves as the mercantile center of the city of Opus and lies a mile from the sea. 7. Philip had been sent warning of this move by the beacon signals from Oreus, but thanks to the treachery of Plator, they had been put up on the lookout too late for him to react. In addition, he was outclassed in naval strength, which made it difficult for his fleet to reach the island. Because of the time that he had lost, he abandoned the attempt, instead moving swiftly to relieve Chalcus when he received the signal. Chalcus is also, in fact, a city on the same island, but the strait by which it is separated from the mainland is so narrow that it is linked by a bridge, which makes access to it easier by land than by sea. Philip, therefore, advanced from Demetrius to Scatussa, and then left Scatussa at the third watch. He successfully dislodged and put the flight, the Aetolian garrison blockading the pass at Thermopylae, driving his panic-stricken enemy 
into Heraclea. And then, in the space of a day, he marched more than 60 miles to Eletia in focus. It was on that day, too, or thereabouts, that the city of Opus was being sacked by King Attalus after its capture. Sulpicius had conceded the rights to the booty from the city to the kingdom because, a few days earlier, Aureus had been sacked by the Roman soldiery, with the king's men having no part in it. The Roman fleet then retired to Aureus, but Attalus, unaware of Philip's approach, continued to fritter away time exhorting money out of the important citizens of Opus. So unexpected was Philip's attack that Attalus might well have been overwhelmed but for a number of Cretans, who, it happened, had gone quite some distance from the city in search of forage, and had forest and hills. Oops, sorry. Once again, the Roman fleet then retired to Aureus, but Attalus, unaware of Philip's approach, continued to fritter away time exhorting extorting money out of the important citizens of Opus. So unexpected was Philip's attack that Attalus might well have been overwhelmed, but for a number of Cretans, who it happened, had gone quite some time had gone quite some distance from the city in search of forage, and had spotted the enemy column in the distance. Attalus's men were without weapons and out of formation. They made a disordered rush towards the sea and their ships, and as they were trying to unmoor the ships, Philip came on the scene, causing great confusion among the sailors, even from the shoreline. Philip then returned to Opus, railing against gods and men for his having lost the opportunity of such a rich prize, and opportunity filched from him almost before his eyes. The people of Opus were also subjected to his resentful outburst. They could have held out against the siege until his arrival, he said, instead of practically conceding defeat at the first sight of the enemy. After settling affairs at Opus, Philip left for Torone. Atlas also left the area. Initially, he went to Aureus, but when it was reported to him that King Prusius of Bith, at, of Bith, oh, Atlas also left the area. Initially, he went to Aureus, but when it was reported to him that King Prusius of Bithynia had invaded his kingdom, he abandoned his Roman venture and the Aetolian War and sailed to Asia. As for Sulpicius, he withdrew his fleet to Aegina, his point of departure at the start of spring. Philip had no greater difficulty taking Torone than Attalus had in taking Opus. The town was inhabited by refugees from P H T H I O T I C Phithiotic Thebes, who, when their city had captured by Philip, and thrown themselves on the mercy of the Aetolians. The Aetolians had then given them a home in this city, which had been laid waste and left deserted after an earlier war, also fought against Philip. After his recovery of Torone, 
which was just mentioned, Philip left the town and took Tithronian and Dromii, small towns of little consequence in Doris. He then came to Alatia, having already... Gee, this is a, quite the few chapters of <clears throat> city names. <laughs> uh, tongue tires, um, tongue twisters. He then came to Alatia, having already issued orders for representatives from Ptolemy and the Rhodians to await him there. At Alatia, there was some discussion of ending the Aetolian War, for the representatives had recently attended the council of the Romans and Aetolians at Heraclea. During the discussion, news was brought that the Malcanidas had decided to attack the Elians, Elians, E-L-E-A-N-S, while they were preparing to celebrate the Olympic Games. Philip thought this should be his top priority, and so he dismissed the representatives with the accommodating answer that he... I'm noticing, like, for example, this current event that I'm reading over now. Often Livy repeats. He has to go back and repeat certain events. Um, yeah, I'm noticing that quite a bit in this, uh, this work. Um, I'm sure it's for a reason. Uh, Philip thought this should be his top priority, and so he dismissed the representatives with the accommodating answer that he had not been responsible for the war, and he would not stand in the way of peace, provided that it could be concluded on equitable and honorable terms. After that, he set off with a lightly equipped column coming down through Boeotia to Megara and then Corinth. At Corinth, he picked up supplies and headed for Phleas and Phineas. Reaching Herea, he heard that Machanidas, alarmed at news of his coming, had beaten a retreat back to Sparta, and the king therefore withdrew to Aegeum to attend the council of the Achaeans. Philip also thought that he would find at Aegeum the Punic fleet that he had sent for in the hope of making some gains by sea. The Carthaginians had, however, left for the Oxii Islands a few days earlier, and had then headed for the Arcananian ports, when they heard that Attalus and the Romans had set off from Oreus. They were afraid that, if they were attacked within the Strait of Arium, that is the narrowest point within the Corinthian Gulf, they would be crushed. Eight. Philip was upset and annoyed. He had moved rapidly in every case. He reflected and yet had failed to be on time for any of these emergencies. And fortune had scoffed at his swiftness by sweeping away every opportunity out of his view. In the meeting, however, he concealed his bitterness and spoke with a confident optimism. He called gods and men to witness that in no place and at no time had the, he failed to head, as fast as was humanly possible, to wherever the clash of the enemy's weapons had been heard. In fact, he said, it was difficult to decide which was greater, his spirit for fighting the war or his enemy's wish to flee from it. Hence, Attalus, slipping through his fingers at Opus and Sulpicius at Chalcis, 
and now, in the past few days, Machinitis too. But one does not always succeed in running away, and anyway, a war cannot be considered arduous, in which one achieves victory merely by coming into contact with the enemy. The most important factor, he said, was that he now had the enemy's admission that they were no match for him. He would soon have a clear victory, and the enemy would find their fight with him no more successful than they themselves expected. His allies were pleased with the king's address. Philip then turned Herea and Trephalia over to the Achaeans, but restored Alephira to the people of Megalopolis, because they provided adequate evidence that it had been part of their territory. After that, he crossed to Antichira, with some ships furnished to him by the Achaeans, three quadrimes, and the same number of Byrims. From there, he put to sea with seven quinquiremes and more than twenty skiffs. These he had earlier sent into the Corinthian Gulf to join the Carthaginian fleet, and landed at Erith Thray. And that is spelt E R Y T H R E. Erythrae, an Anatolian town close to Eupoleus. He did not take the Aetolians by surprise. All the men in the fields or in the nearby fortresses of Potidania and Apollonia fled into the forces, fled into the forests and hills, but in their haste they were unable to drive off with them their farm animals, which were taken as booty and put aboard the ships. Philip sent Nicias, the praetor of the Achaeans, to Aegium with the livestock and the rest of the plunder. He then proceeded to Corinth, and from there had his land forces taken overland through Boethia. Philip himself set sail for, from Senkurai, and that spelled C-E-N-C-H-R-E-A-E, and skirting Attica and rounding Sunium, arrived at Chalcis, virtually passing through the midst of enemy fleets. He had high praise for the townspeople's loyalty and courage, Neither fear nor selfish hopes had swayed them, he said, and he urged them to remain committed to their alliance in future. This is, yeah, Livy already wrote about that. I can't remember which uh, which passage it was, but this is being repeated here. Um, if he preferred their lot to that of the peoples of Oreas and Opus, he next sailed from Chalcis to Oreas, where he put the government and defense of the city in the hands of those its leading citizens who, when the city was taken, had chosen flight over surrender to the Romans. After that, he crossed from Euboea to Demetrius, from which he had first set off to bring aid to his allies. At Cassandrea, Philip then laid down the keels for fifty warships, and assembled shipwrights in large numbers to complete the work. Attalus's departure and the timely assistance Philip had himself brought to his beleaguered <coughs> allies had now left conditions tranquil in Greece, and so he retired to his kingdom to begin hostilities against the Dardanians. Nine. At the end of the summer, during which this took place in Greece, 
Quintus Fabius, son of Quintus Fabius Maximus, was sent by the consul Marcius Livius as his representative to the Senate in Rome. Fabius reported to the Senate that the consul believed Lucius Porcius and his legions were sufficient protection for his province of Gaul, and that he personally could leave the province and the consular army could be withdrawn. The senators then not only ordered Marcus Livius to return to the city, but ordered his colleague Gaius Claudius Nero to do so as well. The only difference in the instructions for the two was that Marcus Livius's army was to be brought back while Nero's legions that were facing Hannibal were to remain in his sphere of authority. The consuls had agreed through correspondence that as they had one policy in their conduct of matters of state, so they would reach the city at one and the same moment, despite coming from opposite directions. Whoever reached Praneste first was un or under orders to await his colleague there. It transpired that the two men reached Praneste on the same day. From there, they sent ahead official notification for the Senate to hold a plenary session at the Temple of Bologna, three days hence, and then they came for towards the city, where the whole population came streaming out to meet them. It was not simply a case of people milling around them and greeting them. They all wanted to touch the victorious sword arms of the consuls, some offering words of congratulation. Others expressions of gratitude, because thanks to them the state had been saved. In the Senate, the consuls, following the practice of all commanders, gave an account of their achievements and then requested as their due for their energetic and successful conduct of state affairs. That honor be paid to the immortal gods, and that they be permitted to enter the city in triumph. The senators replied, that they were certainly ready to grant their request in recognition of the services of the gods, first of all, then of the consuls. And so public thanksgiving in the names of the two men and a triumph for them were officially sanctioned, but an arrangement was made between the consuls that since their military operation had been a cooperative effort, they would not hold separate triumphs. The triumphant exploit it was noted, had taken place in Marcus Olivius's province, and the auspices also happened to be Olivius's on the day of the battle. In addition, Livius's army had been brought back to Rome, while Nero's could not be taken out of his province. Accordingly, the agreement was that the soldiers should follow Marcus Livius, who would enter the city in a four-horse chariot and Gaius Claudius would ride in on a horse and without soldiers. The sharing of the triumph in this way enhanced the renown of both men, but more so that of the one who conceded recognition to the other while surpassing him in merit. That man on the horse, people would say, raced the whole length of Italy in the space of six days, and on the day on which he fought a pitched battle with Hasdrubal in Gaul, he had Hannibal believing that he was encamped opposite him in Apulia. So they reasoned. One consul had defended both halves of Italy and faced two commanders who were superb generals, using his strategy to combat one and meeting the other in the flesh. Nero's name had sufficed to keep Hannibal pinned down in his camp, they said, and what had overthrown and destroyed Hasdrubal, if not the man's arrival on the scene. So the other consul could ride high in his many-horse chariot if he wished, but it was on one horse that his, this triumphal procession was really traveling through the city. Even if he were on foot, it would be Nero who would remain in people's minds, they said, thanks to the glory won in that war, or his disregard for it in that triumph.
Such were the comments from spectators who attended Nero all the way to the capital. The money the consuls brought to the treasury amounted to three million sesterges and ninety thousand bronze assays. Marcus Livius gave each of his soldiers fifty-six assays, and Gaius Claudius promised to give his own men, now absent, the same amount when he returned to his army. It has been observed that when the soldiers engaged in their banter, Gaius Claudius was on that day the butt of more songs than was their own consul. It has also been noted that the equities had high praise for the legates Lucius, Veturius, and Quintus Sicilius, whom they urged the plebs to make the following year's consuls, and that the consuls threw their weight behind this earlier recommendation of the equities. For the next day, at an assembly of the people, they commented on the courageous and loyal services that they had received from the two legates in particular. Ten. As election time was approaching, and it had been decided that the elections would be held by a dictator, the consul Gaius Claudius appointed his colleague Marcus Livius a dictator, and Livius in turn appointed Quintus Caecilius master of horse, Lucius Veturius, and Quintus Caecilius who was also master of horse at the time, were duly declared consuls elect by the dictator Marcus Livius. The Praetorian elections were held next, and the men elected were Gaius Servilius, Marcus Sicilius, Metellus, that is, Marcus Sicilius Metellus, Tiberius Claudius, Asilus, and Quintus Mamilius Turinus, who was at the time a plebeian adile. The elections completed, the dictator resigned his office, disbanded <coughs> his army, and in accordance with a senatorial decree, left for Etruria which was to be his sphere of responsibility. Here he was a... Here he was to hold inquiries into which peoples of Etruria and Umbria had considered succeeding from the Romans to Hasdrubal when he was due to arrive in the area, and which had helped Hasdrubal with troops, supplies, or in any other way. Such were that year's events at home and abroad. The Roman games were repeated three times in their entirety by the Carul Adiles, Gnaeus Servilius Cepio, and Servius Cornelius Lentulus. The plebeian games were also once repeated in their entirety by the plebeian adults Marcus Pomponius Matho and Quintus Mamilius Turinus. In the thirteenth year of the Punic War, the consuls Lucius Veturius Philo and Quintus Caecilius Metellus were both assigned Brutium as their area of responsibility so they could continue operations against Hannibal. In the Praetorian sortition that followed, Marcus Sicilius received the urban jurisdiction, Quintus Mamilius the foreigner's jurisdiction, 
Gaius Servilius, Sicily, and Tiberius Claudius Sardinia. The distribution of the armies was as follows. To one of the consuls went the army that Gaius Claudius had commanded as consul the previous year, and to the other that which Quintus Claudius had commanded as proprietor, two legions in each case. In Etruria, the proconsul Marcus Olivius was to take over the two legions of slave volunteers from the proprietor Gaius Terentius. Livius had already received a year's extension to his imperium. It was further decided that Quintus Mamilius should transfer his jurisdiction to his colleague and take over Gaul, along with the army that Lucius Porcius had commanded as praetor. Mamilius had orders to lay waste the agricultural lands of the Gauls, who had defected when Hasdrubal arrived. Gaius Servilius was, like the previous governor, Gaius Mamilius, assigned the task of defending Sicily with the two legions from Cannae. The old army that Aulus Hustilius had commanded, the old army that Aulus Hustilius had commanded was shipped out of Sardinia and the consuls raised a new legion, which Tiberius Claudius was to take over with him to the island. Extensions of Imperium were accorded to Quintus Claudius and Gaius Hostilius to Bolo, so that they could have Tarentum and Capua respectively as their spheres of authority. The proconsul Marcus Valerius, who had overseen the defense of the coastline of Sicily, was instructed to transfer thirty ships to the praetor Gaius Servilius, and return to the city with the rest of his fleet. 11. In the suspense that gripped the city at such a critical juncture of the war, people attributed every incident favorable or unfavorable to divine intervention, and portents were reported in large numbers. At Terracina, the temple of Jupiter was said to have been struck by lightning. At Satricum, the temple of Mater Matuta, no less frightening for the people of Satricum, were two snakes that slithered into the temple of Jupiter. Actually entering by the door from Antium came news that men harvesting wheat thought the ears of wheat were bloodstained. At Carrera, a two-headed pig was born, and a lamb that was born male and female. At Alba, it was said, two sons had been seen, and at Fregelli, daylight appeared during the night. In the area of Rome, it was claimed that an ox had talked, that in the Circus Flaminius, the altar of Neptune had sweated profusely and that the temples of Ceres, Salus, and Quirinus had been struck by lightning. The consuls were instructed to use full-grown victims to expiate these prodigies, and to hold a single day of public prayer, and this was carried out in accordance with the decree of the Senate. But what frightened people more than all the prodigies whether reported from the outside of the city or seen at home was the fire going out in the temple of Vesta, for which the Vestal, who had been on watch that night, received a flogging at the order of the pontiff Publius Licinius. Although this was the result of human negligence, and was not a divinely sent portent, it was still decided that atonement should be made with full-grown victims, and that public prayers should be offered at the temple of Vesta. Before leaving for the war, the consuls were urged by the Senate to take measures to bring the plebeians back to the land. Thanks to the heaven's blessings, said the Senate, the conflict had been removed from the city of Rome and from Latium,
making it possible to live in the countryside without fear, and it was absurd to pay more attention to Sicilian agriculture than Italian. But this was no easy matter for the people. Free farmers had been swept away by the war. There was a shortage of slave labor. Livestock had been plundered. Farmhouses had been destroyed and burned. Even so, under the pressure of consular authority, large numbers did return to the land. Discussion of the issue had been prompted by complaints made by delegations from Placentia and Cremona, and their agricultural land was being raided and pillaged by their Gallic neighbors. Most of their colonists had disappeared, they said, and they were now left with sparsely populated cities and countryside that was a desolate wilderness. The praetor, Mamilius, was given the responsibility of protecting the colonies against the enemy, and in accordance with a decree of the Senate, the consuls gave official notice that all citizens of Cremona and Placentia were to return to their colonies by a specified date. Then, at the start of spring, the consuls themselves also left for the war. The consul Quintus Sicilius assumed leadership of Gaius Nero's army, and Lucius Veturius, that of the proprietor Quintus Claudius, making up its numbers with soldiers he had enrolled himself. The consuls marched their troops into the territory of Consentia. This they plundered far and wide, but the column, now heavily laden with booty, was set upon by some Brutians and some Numidian javelin throwers in a narrow pass, putting at risk not only the men with the plunder but anyone carrying arms as well. However, it was more of a brawl than a battle, and after sending the booty ahead, the legions reached cultivated land without losses. From there, they set off into Lucania, where the entire population once more accepted its submission to the Roman people without a fight. Twelve. There was no encounter with Hannibal that year. After the recent blow that had fallen both on his country and on himself personally, he did not offer battle, and while he remained inactive, the Romans did not provoke him. Such were the powers, they thought, that one leader possessed, even if all else was fallen apart around him. And I am inclined to think the man was more admirable in adversity than when things were going well for him. He had been fighting a war in his enemy's country, so far from home, over a period of thirteen years, with mixed success. He had an army that was not made up of his own countrymen, but was a mixture, scraped together from all nations, with no shared features in terms of law, culture, or language. They were dissimilar in appearance, and in dress, with different arms, religious rites, and practices, and almost with different gods. But he fused them together with some sort of bond, so su successfully that there was never any seditious behavior, either amongst the men themselves or towards their commander. Despite the fact that in enemy territory, Hannibal was often short of money for their pay, and short of provisions as well. In the First Punic War, there had been atrocious incidents involving the commanders and the men because of the lack of such things. Hannibal's hope of victory had rested entirely on Hasdrubal and his army. And when they were wiped out and Hannibal abandoned the rest of Italy, retiring into the corner of the country of Brutium, who could not find it amazing that there was no mutiny in his camp. For in addition to everything else, there was the further problem that the only way he could hope to feed his army was from the farmland of the Brutii. And this, even were it all under cultivation, was too small 
to feed a force of such magnitude. Furthermore, most young men had been swept away from agriculture by the war, which kept them otherwise employed as had the inbred practice of their nation of merging their military activities with marauding. And no supplies were being sent to him from home, either since the Carthaginians, Carthaginians were preoccupied with maintaining their hold on Spain, as though all was proceeding well in Italy. In Spain, things were in one way going much the same as in Italy, in another very differently. They were the same in as much as the Carthaginians had been defeated in the field with the loss of their commander, and had been pushed back all the way to the ocean on the farthest coast of the country. But they were also different in that Spain, thanks to its geography and the character of its people, was a country better fitted not just than Italy, but than any other part of the world for reviving a flagging war. That is why Spain was the first of the provinces acquired by the Romans, at least on the mainland, but the very last to be totally subdued, which did not, in fact, happen until our day under the command and auspices of Augustus Caesar. Hasdrubal, son of Gizgo, who was the greatest and most famous Carthaginian leader after the Barcas, had at the time returned from Gades in hopes of renewing hostilities. With the assistance of Mago, son of Hamilcar, he held troop levies throughout further Spain and put under arms roughly 50,000 infantry and 4,500 cavalry. On the number of mounted troops, there is pretty much agreement amongst the sources. Some, however, record a total of 70,000 infantry being brought to the city of Silpia. It was at Silpia that the two Punic commanders took up a position on the open plains, determined not to refuse the offer of battle. 13. When Scipio was brought the information that this enormous army had been assembled, he thought he would be no match for such overwhelming numbers with his Roman legions unless he offered at least a show of strength by putting his barbarian auxiliaries into the field against them. On the other hand, he felt he should not have to depend on them for so much of his strength that their switching sides would be a crucial factor. It was this that had been the undoing of his father and uncle. He therefore sent Silanus ahead to Colchis, who ruled over twenty-eight towns, to obtain from him the cavalry and infantry he had promised to raise over the winter. Scipio himself left Turaco and came directly to Castulo, picking up small groups of auxiliaries as he went along, from allies living along his route. At Castulo he was met by the auxiliary troops that Salinas brought, which numbered 3,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. From there he went ahead to the city of Baculia, with the entire army, which now numbered 45,000 men, citizens and allies, infantry and cavalry. As Scipio's men were establishing their camp, Mago and Manisa charged them with their entire cavalry force. They could have caused serious problems for the men engaged in the defense works had it not been for the sudden appearance of some Roman cavalry who had been concealed by Scipio behind a hill that was conveniently situated for this purpose. These now charged the enemy cavalry who were out of formation and right at the start of the engagement drove off the most adventurous of them, those who had ridden up closest to the earthwork, and even advanced amongst the men engaged in its construction. The fight with the others, however, who had become forward, who had come forward in formation and in marching order, was more 
cohorts oh, sorry was more drawn out and long remained indecisive but then light armored cohorts were brought back from the roman outpost and the men at work on the defenses were withdrawn and ordered to take up their weapons more and more appeared on the scene fresh men relieving the exhausted until there was a large body of soldiers charging into the battle from the camp and after the carthaginians and numidians were quite clearly in retreat they began by disengaging in squadrons with no panic or haste disrupting the ranks but then the romans started to put greater pressure on their rear and withstanding the assault became impossible with no thought now for their formation they ran off in all directions talking <clears throat> they ran off in all directions <laughs> taking the shortest possible route the morale of the romans was considerably raised by the battle and that of the enemy correspondingly dis diminished but even so for a number of days after that there were persistent sallies made by the cavalry and light infantry on both sides. 14. When the strength of the two sides had been sufficiently tested in such melees, it was Hasdrubal who first led his troops into the battlefield, and then the Romans also marched forward to face him. Face them but the two lines simply stood in formation before their respective earthworks and no attempt to engage was made by either side and so when the day was coming to an end the commanders marched their troops back to camp the carthaginian first then the roman this sequence of events repeated itself for several days the carthaginian would always be the first to lead his troops from camp and the first to sound recall when they were wary of being on their feet there was no charge no spear thrown and no battle cry raised on either side in the one line the romans formed the center in the other a mixture of carthaginian and african troops and in both armies the allies were on the wings there were spaniards on both sides before the wings of the Carthaginian line stood the elephants, which from a distance looked like castles. By now, the word in both camps was that they were going to fight the battle, deployed as they stood. The two centers composed respectively of Roman and Carthaginian troops, who were the people responsible for the war, would meet each other with morale and strength evenly matched on the two sides. When Scipio saw that this motion had taken a firm hold, he deliberately changed his entire formation for the day on which he intended to engage. In the evening, he passed a tablet through the camp, ordering men and horses alike to be prepared and fed before dawn. Cavalrymen under arms were to hold their horses bridled and saddled. Day had barely dawned when Scipio hurled his entire cavalry and light infantry against the Carthaginian forward post. He then immediately advanced with his heavy armed troops, the legionaries, but contrary to what his own men and the enemy had been firmly expecting, he had strengthened the wings with Roman soldiers and drawn the allies away into the center. As Drubal started, by the shouting of the Roman horsemen, charged from his tent, and when he saw the melee before his earthwork, his own men in a panic, the legionary standards glittering in the distance, and the plain filled with the enemy, he unleashed his entire cavalry force against the cavalry of the enemy. He himself marched from the camp with his infantry column, but in deploying his line he made no change from the usual order. The cavalry fight remained indecisive for a long while, and in fact a decision could not be reached between them because as each side was driven back, which happened almost on an alternating basis, they could retire to safety 
in their infantry line. But when the infantry lines were no more than half a mile distant from each other, Scipio signaled the recall to the cavalry, and, opening the ranks, brought all the cavalry and light infantry into the center of his force. Making two divisions of them, he set them in reserve behind the wings. After that, when it was now time to commence the battle, Scipio ordered the Spaniards, who formed the center of the line, to advance at a measured pace. From the right wing, there he was to command. There he was in command. He sent a messenger. Sorry. From the right wing, where he was in command, he sent a messenger to Salanus and Marcius to instruct them to lengthen their wing leftwards, as they saw him extend his to the right, and to enlarge the enemy with their light infantry and cavalry before the centers could meet. The two wings were accordingly extended by the addition to each of three cohorts of infantry and three cavalry squadrons and of some skirmishers as well, and with these they advanced swiftly, the rest of the troops following at an angle. The line thus arched in the center were the Spanish troops, where the Spanish troops were advancing more slowly. The wings had now come to grips with each other, but the veteran Carthaginians and the Africans, the strength of the enemy army, had not even reached the point where they could throw their spears, and yet they did not dare run to the wings to help their comrades there engage, since they were afraid of leaving the center of the line open to those enemy troops heading straight for them. The wings, meanwhile, were under serious pressure on two fronts. The Roman cavalry, light infantry, and skirmishers had outflanked them and were making side-on attack and the cohorts were bearing down on them in front, hoping to detach them from the rest of the line. 15. It was now a very uneven fight in every sector, mostly because a crowd of Balearic islanders and fresh Spanish recruits were pitted against Roman and Latin soldiery. In addition, as the day progressed, as Drubal's army began to lose strength, the men had been subjected to a lightning attack in the morning, and then had been forced to join the battle line quickly before they could take food to give them stamina. And indeed, this was why Scipio had deliberately delayed matters to ensure that the fighting would take place late in the day, for it was only at the seventh hour that the infantry contingents charged from the wings. It was much later that the battle actually reached the center and the result was that the heat of the midday sun, the fatigue of standing under arms, and hunger and thirst all took their toll on the Carthaginians before they even came to grips with the enemy. So they simply stood there, supporting themselves on their shields. On top of everything else, there were also the elephants. These were driven to distraction by the cavalry skirmishers, and light infantry with their frenzied manner of fighting, and they had moved from the wings into the center. As a result, the Carthaginians, physically and psychologically exhausted, backed away, though they still preserved their ranks. It was as if the line were withdrawing, unbroken, at the commander's order. But when the vis victors observed that the battle had tilted in their favor, they piled on the pressure all the more fiercely from every side. Resisting these assaults was not easy, although Hasdrubal made every effort to try to hold the men back and stem their retreat by crying out that they had a safe haven in the hills to their rear if they withdrew gradually. Fear overpowered their sense of honor, however, and all those closest to the foe began to give ground. Then suddenly they all turned and rushed off in flight. They halted first at the lower slopes of the hills, at which point the Romans hesitated to march their troops up a hill that was facing them, and the Carthaginian officers began to call their men back into position. 
but then the sight of the enemy standards advancing resolutely towards them made them resume their flight and they were driven back in panic into the camp the romans were not far from the enemy earthwork and with their relentless thrust forward would have taken the camp but for a downpour that followed a period of the blazing sunshine which emanates from gaps in clouds that they are heavy with rain so heavy was the rain that the victors had difficulty making it back to their own camp and some were also prey to religious qualms about undertaking further operations that day the carthaginians were weak from their exertions and their wounds and the stormy night was calling them to a rest they sorely needed but the fearful danger they faced permitted them no time to relax as the enemy were sure to attack the camp at dawn they built up their earthwork with stones that they accumulated from all the gullies in the surrounding area hoping to defend themselves with fortifications since they could not count on their weapons for adequate protection but then the desertion of their allies made flight appear a safer prospect than staying where they were the defectors began with Atenes, chieftain of the Turdetani, who deserted with a large number of his people. Then two fortified towns were betrayed to the Romans, along with their garrisons, by the garrison commanders. Faced with this tendency to revolt, Hasdrubal wished to stop the rot spreading further and struck camp the following night when all was quiet. 16. When at dawn, men in his forward post reported that the enemy were gone, Scipio sent his cavalry ahead and ordered the main force to get under way. The men were marched along at such a rapid pace that, had their pursuit kept strictly to the enemy's tracks, they would unquestionably have overtaken the fugitives. Instead, they accepted the assurance of the guides that there was a shorter route to the river Betis, which would enable them to fall on the enemy as they made the crossing. Finding that his way over the river was shut off, Hasdrubal veered toward the ocean, and from this point the Carthaginians' disordered retreat resembled a flight, which put some distance between them and the Roman legions. But the Roman cavalry and light infantry kept harassing them and slowing them down by attacking their rear or flanks. The Carthaginians would halt to counter these repeated assaults, engaging the enemy cavalry at one moment, and their skirmishes and auxiliary infantry the next. And meanwhile, the legions appeared on the scene. After that, it was no longer a battle. It was more like animals being slaughtered, until their leader authorized flight by personally making off to the nearest hills with approximately 6,000 poorly armed men. The rest were cut down or taken prisoner. The Carthaginian fugitives hurriedly fortified a makeshift camp on the highest of the hills, and from there they had little difficulty in defending themselves since the enemy attempts to climb the steep incline came to nothing. But a siege of even a few days in the desolate and barren environment was impossible to endure, and this set off desertions to the enemy. Eventually, since the sea was not far distant, the commander himself had ships sent to him, abandoned his army, and fled to Gades by night. When told of the enemy's commander's flight, Scipio left 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry with Salanus to continue the siege of the camp, and himself returned to Turaco with the rest of his troops. The march took 70 days as he was examining en route the cases of chieftains and communities so that rewards could be assigned on the basis of an accurate assessment of their services. After Scipio's departure, Masinissa had a secret meeting with Salanus, and then wishing also to have his people accept his new program, 
he crossed to Africa with a few of his compatriots. The reason for his suddenly changing sides was not clear at the time, but that his actions did have reasonable motivation, even at the point. Even at that point was subsequently demonstrated by the fact that he remained staunchly loyal to Rome right down to his last years. Mago then headed for Gades in the ships that Hasdrubal sent back. The others, abandoned by their leaders, either deserted or fled, and became dispersed amongst the neighboring communities. No force of any significance in terms of numbers or strength now remained. This was basically how the Carthaginians, thanks to Publius Scipio's leadership and under his auspices, were driven from Spain in the fourteenth year from the commencement of the war, and the fifth from Publius Scipio's acceptance of the province with its army. Not long afterwards, Salanus returned to Scipio at Toraco with the news that his operation had been successfully concluded. 17. Lucius Scipio was sent to Rome with a large number of noble prisoners of war in his charge to report that Spain had been brought to heel. The reaction to the news was general jubilation and pride, except in the case of the man responsible for it. Scipio, who had an insatiable appetite for deeds of courage and true glory, thought the recovery of Spain was little compared with the goal on which his hopes and noble aspirations were focused. He already had his eyes set on Africa and the great Carthage, and he saw that campaign as the crowning glory that would assure him eminence and fame. Thinking, therefore, that he should do some preparatory work and garner the support of kings and nations, he determined to sound out King Sfax first. Sfax was the king of the Masaya Solinians. That's spelt M-A-S-A-E-S-U-L-I-A-N-S. Masai Sulians. Sfax was the king of the Masai Sulians. The Masai Sulians, a people situated next to the Moray, faced just that part of Spain where New Carthage lies. At that point, the king had a treaty with the Carthaginians, but Scipio believed that he would consider this no more important or inviolable than barbarians generally would. Their loyalty always being dependent on the vicissitudes of fortune. He therefore sent Gaius Laelius to Sfax as his spokesman, bearing some gifts. The barbarian was pleased with the gifts, and because the Romans were doing well in every sector, while the Carthaginians were doing badly in Italy and had completely failed in Spain, he agreed to accept a pact of friendship from the Romans. He added the stipulation, however, that the exchange of promises to ratify the pact had to be done with the Roman commander in person. Laelius, therefore, returned to Scipio, having received from the king nothing more than the promise that Scipio should have a safe conduct. For anyone contemplating an attack on Africa, Sfax was important in every respect. He was the wealthiest king in that part of the world. He had already faced these very Carthaginians in war, and the bounds of his kingdom were conveniently situated relative to Spain, separated from it only by a narrow strait. Scipio, therefore, thought the ends justified taking a great rest, since they could be gained in no other way. He left Lucius Marcius in Toraco and Marcus Salinas in New Carthage. Salinas had come there overland by forced marches from Toraco for the defense of Spain, and he himself crossed to Africa with Gaius Laelius. They left New Carthage with two quinquiriums, and relied mostly on the oar since the sea was calm through 
though occasionally they were helped by a gentle breeze. Now, as it happened, Hasdrubal, after being driven from Spain, sailed into the harbor of Siga with seven triremes at that very same time. He had dropped anchor and was bringing the ships to shore when the two Roman quinquiremes were spotted. Nobody had any doubt that they belonged to the enemy and that they could be overpowered by the larger number of Carthaginian vessels before they entered the harbor. However, the Carthaginians succeeded only in creating consternation and alarm as marines and sailors unsuccessfully attempted to get their weapons and ships in a state of readiness. For a slightly stronger wind from the open sea hit the Roman sails and brought the quinquiremes into the harbor before the Carthaginians could weigh anchor, and then nobody dared make further trouble since they were in a harbor belonging to the king. And so they disembarked, Hasdrubal first, and Scipio and Laelius soon after him, and went to the king. 18. Sfax felt it was truly marvelous, as indeed it was, to have generals of the two richest nations of the time come to seek a peace treaty with him on one and the same day. He offered the two men hospitality and as chance had decided on their being under the one roof and in the same home he made an effort to bring them into conversation with a view to ending their disputes scipio however said that while he felt no personal animosity towards the carthaginian that might be ended by talking he could in an official capacity have no dealings with an enemy without the senate's authorization the king put considerable pressure on him to accept an invitation to dinner along with Hasdrubal, so neither of his guests would seem to have been unwelcome at his table, and Scipio did not refuse. They then dined together in Sfax's palace, Scipio and Hasdrubal even sharing the same couch, since that had been the king's pleasure. Indeed, such was Scipio's sociability and instinctive tactfulness in any given situation that he won over, with his smooth conversational manner, not only Sfax, a barbarian with no experience of Roman manners, but a deadly adversary as well. Hasdrubal made it very clear that he had a greater he he had a greater admiration for the man from having seen him in the flesh then because of his military successes, and he said he did not doubt that Savax and his kingdom would soon be in the power of Rome. Such was the man's ability to win people over. Consequently, Hasdrubal felt that the question for the Carthaginians now was not so much how Spain had been lost as how they could hold on to Africa. The great Roman general was not on a pleasure trip or a voyage to pleasant climes, he thought, not if he had left behind a province only recently subdued and left behind his armies too. That was not why he crossed to Africa with two ships, putting himself at the mercy of a hostile land and entrusting himself to a king's authority and his untested word of honor. No. He harbored ambitions of making himself master of Africa, and he had long been contemplating this and openly complaining that he, Scipio, was not at war in Africa, the way that Hannibal was in Italy. Scipio made a treaty with Sfax and then left Africa at the mercy of shifting and generally tempestuous winds he reached the port of New Carthage three days later. Nineteen. While Spain was now quiet as regards the Punic War, it was clear that certain communities, aware of their past wrongdoings, were quiet from fear rather than from any feelings of loyalty to Rome. The most important of these 
both in size and the extent of their guilt, were Illiturgi and Castulo. Castulo had been an ally when things were going well for Rome, but had defected to Carthage when the Scipios and their armies were crushed. The people of Illiturgi had betrayed and killed the men who had sought refuge with them after that disaster, thereby adding an atrocity to their defection. When Scipio first arrived and Spain hung in the balance, severe measures against these people would have been justified but impractical. However, now that there was peace, the time for reprisals seemed to have arrived. Scipio, therefore, had Lucius Marcius summoned from Taraco, and sent him with a third of his troops to launch an attack on Castulo. Scipio himself came to Illiturgus after a march of about five days. The gates were shut, and all measures had been taken and preparations made to counter an attack. Their guilty conscience, their awareness of what they deserved, made a declaration of war redundant. This becomes Scipio's exordium for his speech of encouragement to the men. By closing the gates, he said, the Spaniards had themselves shown they were aware of the fearful punishment they deserved. The war against them should therefore be conducted with much greater hostility than the war with Carthage. With the Carthaginians, it was an almost dispassionate struggle for empire and glory. But these men had to be punished for their treachery and brutal atrocities. The time had arrived, he said, for them to exact revenge for the unspeakable murder of their comrades and for the trap that would have been set for them, too, had their flight taken them to the same place. The moment had also come, he concluded, to set a grim example that would ensure for all time that nobody could consider a Roman citizen and a Roman soldier, whatever his circumstances, a convenient target for mischief. Inspired by these words of encouragement from their leader, the soldiers immediately distributed ladders amongst men who had been handpicked from each of the maniples. The army was also split, so that Laelius could take command of one of the halves of the lieutenant. And they then simultaneously launched their attack on the city at two points, bringing terror on two fronts. It was not one leader or a group of chieftains who inspired the townspeople to a spirited defense of the city, but their own fear, which arose from a guilty conscience. They remembered, and they kept reminding others, that the enemy were not seeking victory over them, but their punishment. What mattered, they said, was where they all met their end. Would they breathe their last fighting in the line of battle, where the dangers of war, equally shared, often raised up the conquered and struck down the conqueror? Or would they do so later in a city burned and destroyed after being whipped and chained and suffering all manner of foul indignities before the eyes of their captive wives and children? And so it was not simply men of military age and males who put their courage and strength into the effort. Women and children did so as well supplying the fighters with weapons and carrying stones to the fortifications for the working parties. It was not just a matter of their freedom, which fires the hearts only of the brave, before their eyes was the specter of the worst tortures of all, and a disgraceful death. Their morale was fired, too, by competing with each other for their share of the work and the danger, and simply by looking at each other. And so, such was the force of the initial clash, that an army that had conquered the whole of Spain was often repulsed from the walls by the fighting men of a single town. 
and fell back in panic in a battle that was not bringing them glory. When Scipio saw this, he feared that all his men's failed efforts would raise the enemy's morale and dampen his men's enthusiasm, and he felt he had to make a personal effort and take his share of the danger. He scolded the men for their faint-heartedness, ordered the ladders brought up, and threatened to make the climb himself if they held back. When he had already come close to the walls, at no small risk to himself, a cry arose on every side from the men, concerned as they were for their commander, and ladders began to go up simultaneously at many points. In addition, Laelius put pressure on from the other side. With that, the resistance of the townspeople was crushed, the defenders were thrown down, and the walls were taken. 20. In the uproar, the citadel was also taken on the side where it was considered impregnable. And this thanks to some African deserters then amongst the Roman auxiliary troops. The townsmen had directed their attention to the spots that seemed to be in danger, while the Romans kept moving up wherever access was possible. The deserters, meanwhile, noticed that the highest part of the city, because it enjoyed the protection of a precipitous cliff, was lacking any kind of fortification and was also without defenders. Some men of sight, sorry, some men of slight build and agile from extensive training, then claimed up where the uneven projections of the cliff face made it possible and they carried with them iron spikes. Wherever they were forced, wherever they were faced with the stretch of rock that was too steep or too smooth, they would drive the spikes into the rock a short distance from each other and thus virtually made steps for themselves. The first men would then haul up with their hands those following them, while the men behind pushed up those ahead of them, and in this way they reached the top. From there they ran down with a shout into the city that had already been taken by the Romans. It was then that the rage and loathing behind the attack on the city truly became apparent. Nobody considered taking captives alive, nobody thought about booty though everything was open to plunder. It was a massacre of armed and unarmed alike, and of women as well as men, the invaders' ruthless fury descending even to the massacre of infants. They then torched the buildings and tore down what the flames could not consume. Such was the delight they took in obliterating even the last traces of the city in wiping out the memory of their enemy's home. From there, Scipio led his army to Castulo. This city was defended not only by people who had come from elsewhere in Spain, but also by the remnants of the Carthaginian army after its widespread flight. But news of the disaster that had befallen a liturgy had reached there before Scipio's arrival, and terror and despair had swept through the city. And since the two parties' circumstances were different, and everyone was looking out for himself, without thought for anyone else, there was at first unexpressed suspicion, and then open disagreement, creating a rift between the Carthaginians and the Spaniards. The Spaniards were under the command of Cerdubalus, who openly advocated surrender, and the Carthaginian auxiliaries were under Himilco, secretly receiving assurances from the Romans. Cerdu, Cerdu Bilus, no, um, spelled C E R D U B. E-L-U-S. 
Cerdo, Balas. The Spaniards, <coughs> excuse me, the Spaniards were under the command of Cerdo Belus, who openly advocated surrender, and the Carthaginian auxiliaries were under Himilco. Secretly receiving assurances from the Romans, Cerdo Belus betrayed to them the auxiliaries and the city. There was more clemency in this victory. There was less guilt on the part of the people, and the voluntary surrender had done much to soothe the Romans' anger. 21. Marcius was then sent off to spring to heal any barbarians not yet completely subdued. Scipio returned to New Carthage to discharge his vows, and also to stage a gladiatorial show that he had prepared to commemorate the deaths of his father and his uncle. The gladiatorial show did not draw on the sort of men from whom the professional trainers usually take their combatants, that is, slaves of the vendor's platform, and free men who put their lifeblood up for sale. All the fighters provided their services voluntarily and without charge. Some were sent by their chieftains to exhibit their tribe's inbred valor. Others readily declared they would fight to please the commander. Others again were driven by a competitive and combative spirit to challenge their comrades and not refuse a challenge that was offered them. Some settled with the sword differences that they had not been able or had not wished to end through discussion, agreeing amongst themselves that the disputed property should go to the victor. And these were not people of low birth, but men of rank and distinction. Now two cousins, Corbus and Orsua, were in competition for the chieftainship of the community called Ide. And they declared that they would fight for it with the sword. Corbus was the elder of the two, but the father of Orsua had been the last chieftain having received the post from an elder brother on his death. Scipio wanted to settle the matter through, through discussion and soothe ruffled feelings, but both men said they had already told the family members they had in common that they would not do this, and they would accept no judge, divine or human, other than Mars. The elder man had confidence in his strength, the younger in his youth, and the two preferred to die in combat rather than to be subjected to the other's authority. They could not be made to abandon such folly, and they provided the army with an outstanding show and an illustration of how great a curse lust for power is amongst mankind. The elder man, by virtue of his experience with weapons and his artfulness, easily overcame the brute force of the younger. Apart from the gladiatorial show, there were also funeral games, which were celebrated as elaborately as the province's resources and the camp environment would allow. 22. In the meantime, military operations were being conducted no less energetically by Scipio's legates. Marcius crossed the river, Betis called the Sirtis by local people, and accepted the surrender of two wealthy communities without a fight. They then came the city of Astapa, which had always supported Carthage, though it was not this that merited Roman anger so much as the fact that its people had been nursing a partic particular resentment beyond what the pressures of the war might arouse towards the Romans. They had a city that could rely neither on its position nor on its defenses for protection enough to justify their confidence, but their natural predilection for marauding had driven them to make raids on the lands around them belonging to allies of the Roman people during which they rounded up some staggering Roman soldiers, camp followers, and traders. They had even 
ambushed a large caravan, large because traveling in small numbers was unsafe. As it was passing through their territory, catching it in an awkward spot and wiping it out. The army was brought forward for an assault on this city. The townspeople, well aware of their guilt, felt there could be no safety in capitulation to such an embittered force, so they also could not hope to save themselves with their fortifications and weapons. They therefore decided to inflict on themselves and their families a deed abhorrent and barbaric. They marked off a spot in the forum for gathering together the most valuable of their possessions, and they told their wives and children to take a seat on the pile they made, heaping up wood around them and throwing on bundles of brushwood. Then they gave specific instructions to fifty armed men. As long as the outcome of the fight was in doubt, they were told, they were to keep their fortunes and the persons more precious than their fortunes under guard in that place. If they saw that the day was lost and the city about to be taken, then they could be sure that all the men they saw marching out to battle would fall in the fight itself. They therefore begged them, they said, in the name of all the gods above and below to bear in mind their liberty, which had to be terminated that day, either by death with honor or by ignominious <clears throat> excuse me ignominious servitude. They therefore begged them, they said, in the name of all the gods above and below, to bear in mind their liberty, which had to be terminated that day, either by death, with this, with honor, or by ignominious servitude, and not leave behind anything on which a furious enemy could vent his rage. They had swords and torches in their hands, and friendly and loyal hands should eliminate what was bound to perish, rather than leave it to the insults and arrogant mockery of the enemy. To these appeals was added a dreadful curse that was to fall on any one deflected from his resolve by hope or squeamishness. After that, they flung open the gates and rushed out in a swift and violent charge, and there was no Roman forward post strong enough to hold them, because the last thing to be feared was the enemy daring to emerge from their fortifications. Only a few cavalry squadrons and some light infantry hurriedly dispatched from the camp to meet the situation came to confront them. It was a battle characterized more by the courage of the combatants and the ferocity of the onslaught than by any regular order. The cavalry that had been the first to face the enemy were flung back, bringing panic to the light infantry, and the fighting would have reached the very edge of the rampart had not the cream of the army, the legionaries, formed a line of battle in the few moments they were given to deploy. Even amongst the legionaries, there were a few moments of alarm in the front ranks, as the enemy, in blind rage, threw themselves with reckless abandon in the way of Roman sword thrust. Then the seasoned soldiers, standing firm against these wild onslaughts, cut down the first corners, combers, bringing those who followed to a halt. Shortly afterwards, the veterans attempted to go on the offensive themselves, only to discover that none of the enemy would give ground, that all were firmly resolved to die where they stood. They then extended their lines to overlap the enemy flanks, an easy maneuver, thanks to their numerical superiority, and killed them to the very last man as they fought in a circle. Twenty-three. In fact, these were the actions of an angry enemy 
taken in the thick of the fray against armed men who were fighting back, and they were in accordance with the conventions of warfare. Another grimer, sorry. Another grimmer kind of slaughter was going on in the city. Scores of weak and defenseless women and children were being murdered by their own citizens, who were hurling bodies, most of them still breathing, onto a burning pyre, while streams of blood choked the rising flames. And eventually these men, too, exhausted from the pitiful slaughter of their own people, flung themselves and their weapons into the midst of the fire. What? Wow. Only when the massacre was finished did the Romans came on the scene. The first sight of the grisly scene left them momentarily stunned and horrified. That Actually, i got to back up there and tell you that's how it's read. Only when the massacre was finished did the Romans came on the scene. Uh, there's an error there. whoop de doo I guess they should have said come on the scene. Um, but anyway, the first sight of the grisly scene left them momentarily stunned and horrified. Then, with the greed inherent in human nature, the soldiers tried to snatch from the flames the gold and silver that glittered amid the pile of other articles. Some were engulfed by the flames, others burned by the blast of hot air, for with the huge crowd pressing forward from behind, there was no way for those at the front to step back. So it was that Estapa was destroyed by fire, and the sword with no plunder for the soldiers. Marcius accepted the surrender of the other peoples of the area who capitulated from fear, and then led his victorious army back to Scipio in New Carthage. It was just at that time that deserters arrived from Gades, with a promise to betray that city and the Punic garrison within it, along with the garrison commander and the fleet. Mago had actually stopped in Gades after his flight and had brought together his brought together ships on the Atlantic coast. Along with these, he had also assembled a respectable force of auxiliaries from the coast of Africa across the strait, and thanks to the assistance of his prefect, Haino, from the Spanish districts closed, closest to him. Assurances were exchanged with the deserters, and Marcius and Laelius were sent to Gades for cooperative action by land and sea. Marcius with some light armored cohorts, and Laelius with seven triremes and a quinquireme. 24. Scipio himself came down with a serious illness. Made worse in the reports of it, people have an inherent love of deliberately exaggerating rumors, and everybody, everyone now added to what he had heard, and this unsettled the whole province, especially its outlying areas. It was clear from the furor, <clears throat> it was clear from the furor that an idle rumor had raised just how much unrest would have been caused had the loss been a real one. Allies did not maintain their loyalty, nor the army its sense of duty. Mandonius and Indibilis had counted on having the kingdom of Spain for themselves once the Carthaginians had driven out, had been driven out. But nothing had happened to bring their hopes of fruition. Accordingly, they spurred their countrymen, that is, the Lacatani, to revolt and Rousing to arms, the Celtiberian youths aggressively pillaged the lands of the Suesatana and Sedatani, who were allies of the Roman people. There was another violent outbreak, this time involving citizens in the camp of Atsucro. There were 8,000 men in the camp stationed there as a garrison to protect the tribes north of the Ebro. It was not the arrival of vague rumors about their commander's life being in danger that was the original cause of these men's wavering loyalty. That had been 
the indiscipline that usually results from a long period of inactivity and a contributing factor was the straightened circumstances of peacetime facing men used to an easy living from plundering enemy territory. At first, there were only surreptitious exchanges between them. What were they doing amongst a pacified people if there were hostilities in the province, they asked each other. And if the war was now over and their mission accomplished, why were they not being taken back to Italy? There were, in addition, demands for pay more insistent than a disciplined soldier would normally make. Tribunes, doing the rounds of the watch, found themselves subjected to insults from the sentries, and there had been nightly pillaging expeditions into the pacified farmland round about. Finally, in broad daylight, men would openly quit the standards without leave. Everything was now proceeding at the whim and caprice of the rank and file, with no heed for military inst institutions and discipline for the orders of those in command. Even so, the Roman camp kept its usual appearance, and for one reason only. The men felt that, as the madness spread, the tribunes would not refuse to join their mutinous insurrection, and so they allowed them to administer justice at the headquarters, and would ask them for the password, and take their turns on guard duty and on watch. While they had effectively undermine the authority of the command structure, they still maintained a display of obeying orders, though they were really following their own. Then the mutiny flared up, for the men observed that the tribunes were disapproving and critical of what was going on, and were attempting to take a stand against it, openly declaring they would not be party to such madness. The tribunes were chased from the headquarters and shortly afterwards from the camp, and, by unanimous agreement, command was put in the hands of the two common soldiers who were the ringleaders of the uprising, Gaius Albius of Calais and Gaius Atreus from Umbria. Completely dissatisfied with the insignia of the tribunes, these men even presumed to take upon themselves the symbols of the highest authority the fasces and axes. The fasces and axes, um, and it never entered their heads that the rods and axes that they were having borne in front of them to intimidate others were actually threatening their own backs and their own necks. The erroneous belief that Scipio was dead was clouding their minds, and they had no doubt that as soon as word of it spread abroad, as it shortly would. War would flare up throughout Spain. In the ensuing turmoil, they thought money could be extorted from the Allies, and the neighboring cities would be pillaged. And in the upheaval, in which anyone could dare to do anything, their own actions would attract less attention. 